Hey friends, there is a lot in the gardening world about homesteading and self-sufficiency, but how do you get there? And is it even possible without acres and acres of land? I've been working on my self-sufficiency journey for about five or six years now, so I'm going to take this time to show you how far I am in my journey and the steps that I took to get there so that maybe this can give you some ideas on how you can also become more self-sufficient. So the very first step to getting to self-sufficiency is first to figure out what you eat. <laughs> I know this seems so simple, but I think if you paid attention to it and you started to record it, you would start to notice some patterns. I thought that we were pretty, you know, exciting eaters. Like we eat all kinds of different things. But when I sat down and actually looked at what we were spending at the grocery store when I first started this, I was very surprised at some of the things that I saw. I noticed that we ate more of one thing than the other, or you know, maybe we would have Brussels sprouts like two times a year, but in my mind, I thought to myself, oh, we eat Brussels sprouts all the time. <laughs> no, we go through, you know, we have like a month or two, you know, usually in opposite ends of the year where we eat a lot of Brussels sprouts. And then for 10 months, we don't eat any Brussels sprouts. So as I was keeping track of that, and the easiest way to do that is if you order your groceries, it's super easy. Go back and look at what your orders were. Otherwise, you can keep your receipts over a period of a month or three months. It's three months is even better because we do tend to eat more seasonally. If you kept your receipts in a spot and then one time, just once, that's all it really takes, is one time sit down and record how much of the stuff that you're buying. You're gonna see exactly how much you're eating of each item. That's gonna tell you a couple things. It's gonna tell you, number one, what you need to be planting. You don't need to plant things you don't eat. <laughs> There's no point in it. I have done it, trust me, every gardener does. We all plant stuff because it's either easier or it's interesting, but then we don't eat it or we barely eat it or we have to force ourselves to eat it and it's not really part of our diet. The second thing it's gonna tell you is how many plants you actually need to plant in order to feed your family for an entire year. The next thing that you need to do, or step two in the self-sufficiency journey, is once you know what you're eating, start perfecting being able to grow that item in season. This is a big one for us, and it, this is probably the thing that took us the longest to get used to, which is seasonal eating. Now, there are still a couple things that we eat that are completely out of season, like lettuce and broccoli. Those are the two that are big for us. We eat broccoli all the time, and we eat lettuce all the time. Now, thankfully, I've been able to come up with an idea of how to be able to grow lettuce at home, even during the summer months here in Florida. But broccoli is one that I suspect we will never get to full self-sustainability because, or self-sufficiency, because we want to eat it when it's not in season. And the only time it's really in season is you can grow it from fall to spring here, but you're not gonna start getting any until you get to winter. So in winter and spring, we eat all of the broccoli that we grow out of our garden and we don't buy any. But during summer and fall, when it's growing, we buy it. So the first step is perfecting being able to grow that vegetable during the season that it is supposed to be growing. If you can really get to growing the amount of plants you need to feed yourself during the season that they're growing in, that is a amazing first step to self-sufficiency. Being able to eat out of your garden every single day is an incredible feeling. I mean, I absolutely love it. And that's your first step. The next one is to learn how to start preserving. And probably the easiest way to start preserving is to freeze. Usually you have to blanch a vegetable, not all, but most. You have to blanch it, which just means you're going to dip it in some hot water and then dip it into cold water. You're just cooking it for a second and then you're cooling it down to stop the cooking process and then you can freeze those items. These are better frozen than others. Then there's something like canning. Like water bath canning is probably the easiest canning to start with. You're basically taking your jars of food and putting them in boiling water. This is for high acid foods. I strongly encourage you to get a book like the Ball Canning Complete Book of Preservation. I'm gonna put it down in the description. It's gonna teach you how to water bath can and uh, the right recipes. So you do have to follow specific recipes in order to make sure that you have the right acidity in your jars. 
The second one is pressure canning. Now this one is a little bit more interesting. It is, it has a bit more science behind it. There's a few more steps around it, but it is completely possible. And once you've done it once, the fear of doing pressure canning kind of goes away because it, once you've gotten through that process, once you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. A lot of steps, but there's a lot of time in between all the steps. So it's very similar to water bath canning, but in a different way. Now I use my way up there, my electric pressure canner, which is the Presto electric pressure canner. This has been a game changer for me when pressure canning, because that thing out there is so easy to use. It's almost like using an Instapot. You just put your stuff in there, you follow the recipe, you put your stuff in there, you hit a button and it does all of the steps for you. It is phenomenal. Now it's not been tested or approved. Although the National Center for Home Food Preservation does not test equipment in general. Um, so there's some people out there that say that they don't trust it. And there's other people that say they do. I lean on the side that I do trust it. So you're going to have to make that decision for yourself. But you can also just go with the old pressure canners where you have to bring the heat up in the pressure. And then you either have the dial gauge or the weighted gauge. And you have to make it get to a certain pressure, usually 10 or 11 pounds of pressure. And then you hold it at that pressure period for a period of time. I've used those in the past. I broke my last one. I'm going to be getting another one because I do think that they are still beneficial for a lot of reasons. You can use it either. But if you're a beginner, I don't know, strongly consider getting one of the electric ones. They're a little bit more expensive than the manual ones. Um, that is true. I think almost like double in some cases, depending on the size that you get. But... So simple. They also don't do as many jars as the regular canners do. This does a maximum of six regular mouth quart size jars or five wide mouth quart size jars. So you can see that that's not a lot of jars, especially if you're canning a lot. And then the next thing you need to do with your gardening is to start working on how to get the most vegetables in the least amount of plants. I know all of us are attaining this, right? But you know, is it possible to actually do that? Yes, it is. There are hundreds, hundreds, sometimes thousands of different varieties out there and different varieties do better in different climates. And so if you're not sure, you can Google it or you can test it. I'm really into testing it. So once I found, you know, like a tomato plant that produces pretty well, I'm like, okay, I'm going to put that one in my garden. I'm going to know that I'm going to get that many, you know, tomatoes out of it. And I know that I'm going to get what I need. But then I put another new variety out there that I think might do well based on its, you know, characteristics. And I see whether or not that one produces more than the other one. And eventually my favorites that I have now usually get replaced with new favorites because I'm always trying out new varieties. And sometimes, not always, probably about 25% of the time, the new variety does exceptionally well compared to the old variety. And so I will replace my favorite with that new variety because it produces more. And that's what I need. I need a plant that's going to produce a lot so I don't have to have as many plants. <laughs> right now, I have an amazing broccoli that I absolutely love, and I can usually do about four plants, and that feeds us, which is crazy, because we eat broccoli every single day. It has a very large head, and it's got great side shoots. Now, the downside is that's Arcadia broccoli, and Arcadia broccoli is no longer created, and it is a hybrid. So I can't create that seed. I can't save that seed. So I am trying out some new varieties this year because I know I only have maybe another year or two or season or two before I'm going to be completely out of those seeds and I'm not going to be able to get them anymore. So I need to start trying new varieties that maybe might be able to take the place of the Arcadia. So that's something to think about. Start thinking about the different varieties and whether or not they produce better than the variety that you're currently growing. The third step to becoming self-sufficient is trying to figure out once you've once you've gotten all that down, which is a big hurdle, that is the big steps that I've just mentioned, it's how to grow or eat out of season. And I'm mainly thinking of summer here in Florida. There is not a lot of things that grow really well here in summer, but there are some things. And the things that do grow really, really well, do they taste good? That is debatable. I have tried, I have tried a lot of summer vegetables. I grow lots of different kinds of Florida summer vegetables. And some of them I really like. My Thai soldier beans, my Puerto Rican black beans, Roselle, 
sweet potatoes. Absolutely love all those vegetables. And then there's some that, mm -hmm, I don't know if I like them as much. <laughs> so there's the, like for greens, I really like, I just found one this year, which was Egyptian spinach and Malbar, red Malbar spinach, which I thought they were both phenomenal. And I still think they are. I do like Ethiopian kale, although I think Egyptian spinach is up in the Ethiopian kale. It's becoming my new favorite. But um, something like amaranth greens, I'm not a fan. I don't like the flavor. Swiss chard, not a fan. Don't like the flavor. So there's a lot of that when it comes to the summer vegetables. So you really, really have to get creative during summer. Grow the things that work, like the sweet potatoes, the okras, the Thai soldier beans, the black beans. Grow all those. But start trying all of those weird tropical varieties. Just grow one or two plants. I usually do two because one might die, so I always have the second one to try. And if I absolutely love it, it gets added into my favorite list and then I grow lots of it the following summer. Another way to extend your season or to grow things outside of seasons is to grow them inside. I'm really thinking of summer here. We like lettuce. Lettuce is an expensive thing to buy. I, I know it doesn't seem that way because when you go to the grocery store, it's a reasonable price. It's like $4 a bag. Well, those bags are usually only half a pound, so it's only eight ounces. The amount of lettuce that we eat comes out to hundreds of dollars. And so I had to figure out a way to be able to grow lettuce during the summer. I grew all the tropical varieties. They don't quite hit. They're not exactly like lettuce, not like romaine, that crunchy, you know, crispy, watery, you know, flavor lettuce. <laughs> That's what we like. They're not quite like that. Usually they're mostly soft or they have that earthy flavor or they have that little bitter crunch or a little spice. And I'm not really into any of that. I want my lettuce to taste like lettuce. So we opted to grow hydroponic lettuce or you could grow lettuce in just a grow tray, you know, like have a tray or a pot and have grow lights. Those are all options. So think about some of the out of the box ways that you can grow things when they're out of season. Then the next thing is to consider my rule of 80%, the 80-20 rule. I'm sure everyone has heard the 80-20 rule. It's just basically try to get 80% of the way there and then 20%, you know, you just have to call it even. <laughs> so the way that I think about this is, I want to get to 100% of growing our lettuce and that I have. I'm going to share with you in just a second exactly where we are with all of our vegetables in terms of how self-sufficient we are. But lettuce, I wanted to get to 100%. And we are at, I'm going to call it 100%, but it's probably more like 95%. If we have friends come over and we're hosting a big dinner, I may not have that amount of lettuce at that moment. I have enough to feed two. I don't have enough to feed eight. Usually when I grow stuff, I'm growing it for two of us, my husband and I. I'm not growing it for parties <laughs> because it's wasteful, right? If I don't have a party, if we don't have a dinner party or we don't have family coming over, all that lettuce is going to go to waste. So instead, I grow it for the two of us. And on the occasion that we have people coming to visit, we then go to the store and buy some extra lettuce. It's a, you know, it's great that we have that option and we don't live in a day and age where we don't have the store right down the street and we can buy whatever we need. Um, but in our house and in our food and what we eat on a regular basis, we are hundred percent self-sufficient at lettuce. So how self-sufficient are we in our house? Um, I'm going to break this down for you and I have my, my trusty notes right here. And I have some of the vegetables that we grow sitting all around me in my little milk crates. I have potatoes over here, sweet potatoes up here, a little bit outside of you. You saw it in the last, probably um, the last scene or in the last way I was standing. Um, you probably saw the garlic behind me and all the jars. So we are, in terms of vegetables, 73% self-sufficient. 73. I know that's very specific, but I am a very, like you guys know, <laughs> I'm super calculating. I like to calculate all these things out. So the things that we are a hundred percent self-sufficient at, not including those special occasions when people come over, all of our cooked greens. I grow all of our greens in the winter and I usually grow kale and, um, broccoli greens. That's usually what we do, but you can also grow different types of spinaches. I 
blanch those and freeze them. And that's what we use the whole year round. So we are 100% there. And then of course we eat them fresh. Sweet potatoes, right behind me, I grow always a year's worth of sweet potatoes. In fact, I grow so many of them during the summer that I'm almost getting to the point where I am supplying two households with 100% of their sweet potatoes. Um, mostly I use them as a cover crop. My sister loves sweet potatoes. She's a vegetarian, so that's a big part of her diet. And we love sweet potatoes. Beets, we are 100%. That's mainly because we don't eat a significant amount of beets, but I do can them and we eat a lot of canned beets. We are uh, 100% uh, sufficient on garlic as of this year. This year. Last year, I did have to buy some garlic powder, but this year I have fresh garlic, I have frozen minced garlic, and then I have garlic powder. So we are 100% this year. Um, tomatoes. We are at 100% of all of our tomato products, including sauce, salsas, tomato paste, um, not ketchup. We don't eat a lot of ketchup. It's mainly what we eat tomato products with. And then of course, fresh eating. Um, and I save some in the off months. Now we only have about two or three months during the year that we are not producing tomatoes. And so I have some tomatoes that get frozen for that period of time and I pick them while they're green so that that way when we get towards the end of the season, I pick some green ones and then it takes them a month or two. So we still, still, even though my tomato plants have been down for almost two months, we still have tomatoes in the fridge right now. And we put them in the fridge so that they last longer. And I know that's not everyone's really into that. We are 100% sufficient on our squash. I was just showing you um, some of our winter squash um, and our uh, summer squash, we are 100% as well. Now, we don't eat as much summer squash because I don't produce as much. But if I produced more, which I'm working on, we would definitely eat more of it. Now, winter squash, I am really good at growing these. And so we are, we always save them. We always have some, uh, always have some sitting in these milk crates at any given time during the year. I grow them twice a year. And so we're 100% with that. We're 100% with peppers. Um, sweet and hot peppers and I bring them in from the garden. I keep a couple for fresh eating and then the rest of them get chopped up and put in the freezer. That's our favorite way. We are 100% on dry beans, black beans, red beans, kidney beans, cannelloni beans, black beans, the little pintos which are whip oil and cow peas. Those are all the beans that we eat. And then green beans, we are self-sufficient. I grow those two times a year, and when we pick them, we freeze them, and that usually covers us. Sugar snap peas, we're 100% on that. Not snap, not snap peas, because those, uh, you don't eat the pods, and I've never really grown them much, so we still buy a little bit of those kinds of peas, but I have now made a commitment that I'm not gonna buy any more of those. I'm going to try to grow them all, and this is gonna be our big season to see if we can grow them. Cabbage. We only eat cabbage seasonally, so we only eat it when it's grown in the garden. We never buy it. And kohlrabi, you can't buy it in the store here. <laughs> I don't know anyone that sells it, so that's always 100% because we can only grow it here. Things that we are close and what I would put at, you know, above 50%. I put lettuce on here because we do it indoors and we do it outdoors, but there are on occasion when it's not keeping up with our our um, amount of eating and that's usually in the off season when we're growing it and we have gotten really close this year probably like I said 95% white potatoes mm. I was getting so close two years ago to never buying white potatoes but I had a year of terrible results with potatoes so we are back down to 50% carrots we were eating 35 pounds of carrots from winter we're almost out so we have a few months before we're gonna eat carrots again. So we uh, we wait until it's seasonal again. Now, if we had a need for carrots, although I don't see that we will, you know, we would just pick something else to eat if we had people over that we might have like the squashes or the sweet potatoes, but um, we would go out and buy them. So, but I would say we're at 90% for carrots, 80% for cucumbers. We make our own pickles um, and we can grow cucumbers two times a year here in fall and spring. And so that usually covers us. We just don't buy them when, you know, they're not growing. we this, just this year, got to 70% of celery, which I'm very excited about because we were at 0% last year. We're at 70% this year. I chop it up and I freeze them in vacuum sealed packs and I take those out and use them in stir fries, in soups, in um, 
you know, roasts. When I make a roast, I'll pull out and, and use the celery there. And we have not bought celery. If we wanted fresh celery, we use that during the season that it's growing. Otherwise, we don't eat it other than cooked when it's out of season. Now, the things that I'm still working on. I had a really bad onion season last year and the year before, honestly. I can get onions to grow, but I keep shading them out. It's my fault. I know. I'm going to do something different. So we're only about 25% self-sufficient on onions. We are not self-sufficient on corn. Maybe 10%. We end up buying our corn. And just this year, I switched from buying at the grocery store to a, a farm that's nearby that they will even pick it for us and everything. And they will um, give us, you know, huge bushels of corn for very small amounts. We usually eat our corn frozen or canned. I really like it canned. I don't know why. I'm probably the only one that really likes it canned, but I really like it canned. So now that we're going to be buying it from that farm, it just makes more sense. I'm probably never going to be self-sufficient on corn, mainly because corn is challenging. And for me, the most appropriate time to grow it is spring. And, uh, and you need a lot of room to grow corn. The pollination and then the bugs and the earwigs and a lot, a lot of fertilizer. It's just not, I mean, when you can buy corn for so cheap from a, a farmer right down the road, like, why not? Even at the store, it's really, really cheap. Like I mentioned earlier, broccoli, <laughs> because we like to eat it so much and I haven't figured out a way to grow it outside of season. There are types of broccoli that you can grow during the summer that are um, sprouting broccoli, but it's mainly the leaves that you're eating and not necessarily the heads. And we're very much into the heads of broccoli. Cauliflower, we mostly eat cauliflower in season, but we do like to mix it up. And if we just been eating too much broccoli, we will mix it up and get some cauliflower. So we're not, we're still working on that. Brussels sprouts. Last year was my first year where I was actually able to grow Brussels sprouts and I, I have a video for that. So make sure to check that out. But um, that probably got us about 50% of the way through our Brussels sprouts. I canned some uh, in the in the balsamic maple Brussels sprouts, but I wasn't a huge fan. So we didn't have as many saved the way that we like to eat them. So this next year when I get them, I am going to blanch them and freeze them and see if we like that better that way. So right now we're still working on that. And then something like asparagus or artichokes, it's not going to work. <laughs> I know people here in Florida can grow asparagus. I know that. I have not had any luck with it. I also don't have the space for it. So we will continue to buy that. Now let's talk. That's all the vegetables that we eat. You may have additional vegetables on your list that you eat that uh, we don't. We have fruit. So fruit, we are only about 15 to 20% self-sufficient in our fruit. And that's mainly because we were so focused on becoming self-sufficient on our vegetables in our annual garden that we just started really working on our fruit production. Now we've got a couple trees that we've had for a number of years, but most of the trees that we have now we bought this last spring. And some of them are of fruiting age and some of them are not. So we have 50% of our peaches come from our peach tree. The other 50% we buy. 60% of the blackberries we grow ourselves. 40% of our strawberries we grow ourselves. And now 30% of our melons, cantaloupe, and watermelons we grow ourselves. We are not self-sufficient in apples. Bananas, although I have a banana tree, I now have two. Plums, I have two plum trees now, but we're not. Mangoes, we planted a mango tree at my mom's house because they die up here, but at my mom's house, it's a little more south. Grapes, we are not, and we probably never will be, and though we love them. Oranges, we'll probably always buy oranges. Citrus greening, citrus greening disease, we had that on our lemon tree and on our lime tree, and it essentially killed the tree. I would just like to focus on trees that I know can grow for a long period of time without that kind of disease. So we're probably never gonna have citrus on our property. Avocado, we have an avocado tree. It did not fruit last year. We're, we're hoping for next year. And then pineapples, we buy them now, but we have a little pineapple ring that we're creating and hopefully we'll have enough plants in a few years that we'll never have to buy pineapples. Fruit is one of those ones that you really have to work on and you have to think ahead. And I would strongly encourage you if you really wanna get self-sufficient with fruit, make a goal every year of adding one fruit to your garden or your little mini orchard or your huge orchard, whatever you have. 
but make a goal to add one or two trees each year or one or two bushes each year. If you do that, you're just going to slowly start to create the self-sufficiency, mainly because fruit produces a lot, but they don't produce all year round. So you're going to have to freeze things. We freeze our berries. We make smoothies out of them. We make jam out of them. We use them for pie filling. We freeze them. We can them. We do all kinds of stuff. For melons and cantaloupes and things like that, there's not much you can do. So you need to eat them fresh and then you need to either go without them the rest of the year or you have to buy them. Stone fruits like peaches, plums, nectarines, they produce one time during the year, but then you can can them uh, or you can freeze them. Then you have things like bananas and mangoes and avocados and pineapples that are more tropical, those are going to produce at different times than, than the traditional stone fruits and stuff. So usually what you can do if you focus on this and you're getting one or two trees, try to get one or two trees when their harvest time is at different times. So you may be in March eating a ton of peaches and then in July, you might be eating a ton of blackberries. And then in, you know, October, November, you might be eating, you know, lemons and oranges and citrus. And then in December, you're eating avocados. Like the goal is to try to spread the harvest times out so that you have some fruit at all different times. At least that's the way we do it. We are 100% self-sufficient on all of our herbs besides salt and black pepper. We buy our salt in bulk and we buy our black pepper in bulk. All the other seasonings, taco seasoning, Italian seasoning, herb de Provence, chili seasoning, all those things we make our own, we grow it and we make it and we even do some medicinal recipes as well with our herbs. Now the things that we are absolutely not sufficient in and probably will never be sufficient in is grain, meat, and dairy. So meat and dairy <laughs> and eggs, I guess that, I don't know if that falls into meat or dairy, but meat, dairy, and eggs require an animal. <laughs> we still like to RV, which means that we leave for long periods of time uh, and we would be leaving the animals alone. And I know that there are ways that you can do that, but we leave for long periods of time. We don't leave for like a week or two, we leave for months. And so it's not fair for us to have animals at this point. We probably could fit some small animals like rabbits or uh, chickens, but our property is not able to, I mean, county ordinance as well as size, we can't take any larger animals like sheep, lambs, definitely not a cow, you know, <laughs> we can't do any of that. So dairy is out for us. We, I don't want to say never, but I very much doubt that we would ever move to a property that was so large that we could have those kinds of animals. We might move to a property that's larger where we could have chickens and rabbits. Um, our property isn't small. We could probably have them here in county ordinance. We could, but uh, I don't know. With all of the garden space, if we were to put those animals in our backyard, we would have no space for, you know, having fun with our dogs and the nieces and nephews and the family and stuff and uh we're just we'd rather buy that so that that's that way and then grains grains we can grow we can grow amaranth we grow rice you can grow corn if you really try you can grow potatoes obviously that can be used as it oats flour couscous chai seeds those kinds of things wheat i think you can grow that stuff down here but you need to be able to grow a lot you need to have a lot of space to grow grains. Rice didn't seem that bad, but you then need to process it, which was my biggest problem with rice. I did a video on how I grew rice and how much you can get out of one square foot. One square foot gave us like a fourth of a cup of rice, which I thought well, that was pretty good. But a fourth of a cup of rice is not gonna go very far. So you need lots and lots of square feet. And then you need a way of processing the grain. It's not like a vegetable where you just pick it off and you can eat it. It has a, it's usually a seed or a husk around the seed and you have to process that to be able to remove it. My biggest problem with grain is I don't want to have to do that processing or I don't want to have to buy these big pieces of equipment to do those processing. So grain is probably something we will never be self-sufficient in, but we do buy it in bulk from Azure Standard and I feel like that is a good compromise. So speaking of what I am self-sufficient in, I think it would be helpful as we move back to how you can make progress in your self-sufficiency goal is to talk about my suggestion on what you should work on first, second, third. 
So the first thing I think you should work on is herbs. Herbs are the most expensive thing that you can buy in the grocery store, dried or fresh. They are very expensive and you can grow them in tiny, tiny spaces. They are perennials, which means you plant most of them, not all, like basil isn't. But you can plant them once and you have them forever. They produce enormous amounts of herbs <laughs> and you can use them lots of different ways. I did a whole video on like 30 herbs and how to grow them down here and all that. Herbs are number one, the easiest way to get self-sufficient. Number two, greens. Not necessarily lettuce, but cooked greens. Because you can freeze them, you can can them, you can grow a significant amount. If you're growing, you can, I mean, you can grow greens all summer long. You can grow sweet potato greens, Egyptian spinach, red Malabar spinach, Ethiopian kale. There's a ton. You could grow all your raw greens and all your cooked greens. And that's a really easy, not easy, but good place to start if you're working on self-sufficiency. Work on your herbs first, your greens next. And then the next thing I would say is focus on your summer vegetables. I know, you're probably like, why would I do that? Because summer is our longest season. Summer is our longest season here, which means you can grow the most of things during summer. And what I mean by that is I can grow a year supply of sweet potatoes, no problem. Neglecting them, ignoring them, and just leaving them in the ground and they're gonna produce abundantly. Enough so that I can supply myself and my sister's family. So think about the things that grow long periods of time. The Puerto Rican black beans will grow all through summer and they will just keep producing, producing, producing without me having to do anything. I don't fertilize them, I don't water them, I don't do anything for these things. Um, so for me, they're an easy plant to grow and they produce a lot in our summer when nothing else does. Like, that's a good place to start. The next one would be things that preserve well. And that could be freezing, dehydrating, or canning. Or freeze drying, if you have a freeze dryer. I don't have one. I'm hoping to have one one day. But that's going to be things like tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, peas, carrots. Those are the ones that stand out to me as plants that do preserve really, really well and very easily and in lots of different ways so you, you can keep them long. Um, another one would be things that cure on their own like squashes, potatoes, onions, and garlic. You can leave them at room temperature for long periods of time, months on end, and they basically become shelf stable all on their own. And that's winter squash, not summer squash. And then the fourth one that I think you should focus on after you've gotten through those three levels, which are still a lot of levels, is going to be fruit. And it's not a bad thing to start peppering in or just, you know, a little, mm, I'm going to put this tree in, mm, I'm going to put this fruit bush in now because it's going to be anywhere from one to five years before you're going to get fruit. A mulberry will produce the first year, but a java de cava is going to take like eight years to fruit. <laughs> so those are things that you can just buy them now, set them in the ground, get them healthy, get them settled, and then pretty much ignore them, which is what I do for most of the year. And then they're just going to grow, 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 grow. And then one day you're going to go out there and there's going to be flowers on them. And then there's going to be fruit and it's going to be amazing. If you take it from that approach rather than, oh, I want to buy a peach tree because I want peaches next year. It's not a good idea because you're going to get this. You're going to get frustrated with the fact that that fruit takes a while. And the first season that you get fruit is not great. The first two seasons, which is usually two years. The first two years that they start producing fruit, it's very minimally. My blackberries produced last year and it was like, I don't know, a dozen blackberries. But this year I got quite a bit. Last year my blueberries and this year my blueberries didn't produce a lot. I mean, maybe one little clamshell pack, not, not great. But I'm suspecting that by next year they will have matured even more and grown up some more and I will get a better harvest out of them. So the way that you have to think about it is not only do you need to plant the tree, and it needs to acclimate to its environment, and it needs to be of a mature age, but then you've got at least two fruiting seasons before you're gonna be getting anything that is a decent sized harvest. So if you walk in with those expectations, knowing that it's gonna be, this is an investment, this is a three, four, five, 10 year investment, that in down the road, you're gonna get it. If you set those expectations now, 
then you know when it comes time for you know flowering time next year and it doesn't produce much or it doesn't produce any you're like ah, i knew that that was going to happen give it another year let's see what happens next year and you at least have that good expectation or that solid expectation that you're not expecting a lot from it but when it does fruit when it does get to mature size and it does fruit it is insane <laughs> the amount of fruit that comes off these trees it is crazy all right, the last thing I want to talk about is back to that 80-20 rule. You are not, I don't want to say that. You, you're probably, I'm stuttering. <laughs> you're probably not going to get to 100% self-sufficiency in all areas of your life. I don't think that that occurs normally. You know, I, I mean, you do have to get salt from somewhere you can't really grow that you know if you want to make your own laundry so if there's still the ingredients that you need to get that you probably can't grow or create in your home there's a lot of things where the bit sugar i mean you could grow sugar cane but are you going to grow enough to be able to it's kind of like the grain crop you know is it, are you going to have enough space to grow all that and maybe you will uh, but i think having that healthy expectation that i don't need to get to 100 percent, 80 percent is a great number 80%, you will feel it in your budget, in your pocket, in your health. You will feel 80%. And 80% is just as good as 100% if you just have to go to the store every once in a while. You don't want to be aiming to be perfect. You want to be aiming for progress, at least in my opinion, in my humble opinion here. Aiming for progress towards self-sufficiency, I think, is more important than aiming for perfection or complete self-sufficiency. Do what you can with what you can and don't ruin the experience getting down on yourself that you didn't make it, you know, to this far or you're not at 73%. Guys, it took five, six years. <laughs> this is not a short term. And sometimes I slide backwards and sometimes I get to go forward. You know, it's a, it's a two step forward, one step back type situation. <laughs> Um, there's a saying, there's a quote, and I love this quote, and I wrote it down. So often we become so focused on the finish line that we fail to enjoy the journey. And this is by Dieter Odoff. I think that is German. I could be wrong. Dieter Odoff. So often we become so focused on the finish line that we fail to enjoy the journey. The journey to self-sufficiency is the fun part. <laughs> reaching self-sufficiency that's great it's a finish line it's awesome that you get there if you get to 50 percent if you get to 100 percent, that's amazing but don't forget to enjoy the journey the journey is the cool part the journey of learning and growing and watching all these things happen and knowing the confidence that you're building in yourself that to me is very very cool very fun and almost as important, if not more, probably to me, it's more important than actually hitting that finish line. I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed spending time with you guys. Um, check out these next videos if you want to watch more between now and my next upload. Happy gardening, guys.